Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Dragonfly Heart Medicine Radio um, podcast. We're on episode 11, and thank you so much for joining in and for listening and supporting as always. And today I have a guest that I have personally known for, I don't know, several years, and I've had um, the pleasure of attending some of her yoga retreats where she also cooked delicious, yummy food. And um, I'm really excited to have her. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself and then we'll dive into our conversation. Cool, thanks, Kristen. I am Stephanie Toller. I, hmm, how to define myself? I wear a lot of hats, like Kristen mentioned. Um, I'm a certified yoga instructor. I've got my 500 hour, um, which is the advanced training. I also teach home cooking, healthy home cooking classes. I've done a number of cooking schools around the world, um, and it's been a passion of mine for a really long time. Um, And the biggest thing probably recently is health coaching. I recently finished um, with Institute for Integrative Nutrition, their health coaching program, which has been really amazing. And yeah, so just really looking to get the word out to the world about the basics of self-care, about healthy eating. Um, In my own journey, I've gone from, you know, pasta, roni, ramen, and, uh, you know, whatever in a box, prepared meals to um, really healthy home home cooking, clean eating, um, all whole foods diet. So really that's my biggest message in the world probably is about food, food and wellness in general. So thank you for introducing yourself, giving us a little information. And I mean, we hear the saying, you are what you eat. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I was little, I used to take that really literal, like, oh, I'm gonna turn into like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if I eat that all the time. Um, but there is a lot of truth in that we are what we eat. Uh, everything we put into our body is going to be beneficial for us or not so beneficial. Um, and so when would you say you really uh, fell in love with cooking and what led you into actually uh, pursuing health coaching? Yeah, so um, cooking, I guess that's been a passion for a really long time. My mother was Sicilian, like off the boat Sicilian. Um, and so I was raised in a, you know, household where there was lots of aromas and fresh food all the time. My grandmother was an amazing cook. Um, my dad's not Sicilian, but he also really loved cooking. And so it was just an important part of home life, I would say. Um, and then I remember when I was 13 or something, cooking became one of my chores. So I was making the family meals and I loved it. I remember making a meatloaf and putting my handprint in the top. <laughs> to decorate to make it aesthetically appealing I'm sure my family really enjoyed that one um but I just always have had a a, an interest in it I think because of how my life started um and how it was treated in the home you know when I got to be a, a teenager and living on my own I got way more into processed foods I remember my high school had a Taco Bell and a McDonald's and all of these fast food joints like in the high school and that was our cafeteria sadly um so my healthy eating definitely derailed once i got into that more rebellious state where you don't care what mom does you don't care what dad does and um definitely went into more of the processed foods and that carried on through my 20s um my interest in health you know it started more from, I would say, a, a va- place of vanity and ego. You know, I um, wanted to keep up with other people and compete and to look good. So I ran marathons in my 20s, which I didn't realize was actually very taxing um, and stressful to my body, which was already super depleted um, due to poor nutrition. And um, then I was like hardly eating. You know, a lot of young women have eating disorders. I think I've had them all. Um, not to self-diagnose or over-diagnose, but it's just the culture and it's just what's going on, unfortunately. Um, so what I thought of as healthy was kind of calorie restriction, which is absolutely not healthy and over-exercising, which again is 
now I think of exercise, I don't even like to use that word because of the connotations it has in the in our culture, but I like to say movement um, rather than exercise, I think is really important. So my evolution, however, came, I would say mm, four years ago, I started having some health trouble five years ago, somewhere in there and um, couldn't really get answers from doctors. Uh, it's taken a while to push to get to a place where I actually have some clarity around what was going on and what has been going on. But somewhere in that journey, I was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, which when you think about my over-exercising and not eating and also um, my job, you know, I was doing, I was working in startups. So I had the whole business thing going on, really high pressure high pressure job title work situation. Um, so the adrenal fatigue made a lot of sense. I didn't really know what it was until I was diagnosed with it and started to learn more about it. That led me into uh, looking at food sensitivities and elimination diets because you can't heal adrenal fatigue if you're eating foods that your body is reacting to. All it does is increase the cortisol response and increase the stress hormones in the body. So I started looking at my food and playing around with how foods were affecting me. Um, and my diet just got cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And um, despite having these health issues, which I don't even really want to get into all of that, um, I feel better than I ever have. Um, so it's kind of this ironic thing, um, but I am getting to a place of resolution and moving beyond all of that. But yeah, basically I've been the product of our culture, you know, I would say when it comes to um, eating and health and having my health kind of go sideways after my mom died, that's another thing it seems like when there's a high stress situation um, and we don't know how to take care of ourselves, that's when things start to bubble up, things start to crop up in terms of our own personal health. So that's kind of the general long-winded journey of how I got into to food. Um, yeah, and just cleaning up the diet, dropping gluten, dropping dairy, both of which are very highly inflammatory um, for most people, I believe. Yeah, and finding alternatives and just working working around all of that. Wow, oh, thank you for sharing um, a little bit more detail of your story. I can relate a lot um, around the college age and um, there was dessert available all the time, like in the cafeteria. So I already had like such a big sweet tooth and I would just like be like, oh, nobody's here to regulate how many brownies I have. So I'm just gonna have five. And, you know, then it would be <laughs> feeling like bad. I gained like the freshman 15. So then I got really involved into exercise and I would act like go to the campus rec and do like two of their group workouts, like in a row. And then sometimes do yoga after that. And then I also got into running and like, I was malnourished and I didn't realize how much weight I had lost until I was like out of town and happened to catch a look at myself in like a full length mirror. And I was like, whoa like this can't be healthy so I can definitely relate to like that need of you know the the calorie restriction and I've noticed as I've let that go and I allow myself to actually eat food and like you know healthy portions I feel so much better and my metabolism is better as a result too like when I was really restricting calories like my metabolism just shut down and then I reached a point where things flipped and I started gaining like a lot of weight and so it's just really interesting um, and I too have recently given up gluten because it just does not make me feel good it's a little harder to give up dairy still really like yogurt um, I understand I've given up dairy before uh, as well um, so you recently, I've recently attended a cooking class with you, and I know you plan on doing um, possibly more of those. Um, can you tell us what some of your favorite go-to meals are, or um, like sides, or just anything that you really love to cook and that are pretty easy? Sure, yeah. Um, it's summertime and it's hot out right now, so one of my favorite things is smoothies. Super easy you know, and it's a great way to get nutrition in and they're healthy. They're really healthy and they're really sweet and they can scratch that itch for that sweetness. Um, I like to, you have to have a good blender. I have a Ninja. It's awesome. 
Um, I like to throw in a handful of greens, which you don't even notice at the end, you know, but really getting in those phytonutrients. Um, so a handful of, a lot of times I'll just get the, um, you know, the prepared salads, but I'll get the like power protein greens, you know, it's just a mix of like spinach and arugula, um, all the good stuff just a handful just to keep it easy or even frozen spinach works you know um with a lot of berries blueberries and strawberries my favorite mix um coconut milk which i like to get the native forest it's more expensive but it doesn't have guar gum or any of the other additives it's just straight up coconut milk in a bpa free can um so yeah you got greens berries coconut milk a really ripe banana, which you get so much sweetness out of the banana. And um, I usually do like a tablespoon of sun butter, sunflower seed butter for protein. So you're not spiking the blood sugar. So that's what five ingredients. And if that's not sweet enough for you, which some people do kind of need a little transition because processed foods are unnaturally sweet and we actually lose our taste for natural sweetness, which peanut butter, if you stop eating junk food, candy bars, all of that, and you take a little bit of peanut butter, you'll see how sweet it actually is, which I don't think a lot of people think of nuts as being sweet, but they have a natural sweetness to them. So yeah, pretty simple, handful of greens, banana, berries, coconut milk, and a little bit of nut butter, whatever kind you prefer. Sounds so sad. that's, it's so yummy and it's so easy. It takes like five minutes boom, and you're done. So that's a favorite. Um, another favorite, because it's really easy um, and convenient and pasta, you know, I like to do obviously gluten-free pasta. Some are better than others, you know, you can look through. Some are made with just for me, generally, when I'm picking up packaged foods, which pasta is a packaged food, it's a processed food. It's as processed as I as I get. Um, I always flip it around. I always read the labels because you'd be surprised what, what they sneak in there. Um, and if you don't know what the ingredient is, don't eat it. That's a huge rule for me. If it doesn't make sense up here in your mind, it's not going to make sense in your belly. Um, so I usually go for the pastas with as few ingredients as possible. So one of my favorites, I can't remember the brand right now, but it's literally made from mung beans and rice and that's it. And it's actually a really good pasta. And in the final product, you don't even notice that it's not your typical pasta. So I'll usually pick up some gluten-free penne and I like to do um, pasta primavera, which is pasta with veggies. And if I'm really feeling I need the protein, I'll throw some chicken in there. It's super easy. So whatever veggies you have on hand, that's how easy this gets, right? Usually mine starts with onions and mushrooms. I love onions and mushrooms and I put them in everything. And from there, it's whatever I have. I'll put carrots in there. I'll put peas in there. Um, I've put cabbage, sauteed cabbage is actually delicious in there before. Um, broccoli, cauliflower, frozen vegetables. It's so easy to keep healthy, organic frozen vegetables on hand. You know, they're harvested at the peak of freshness. So oftentimes frozen vegetables and fruits actually have more nutrition than the fresh frozen vegetables and fruit you get at the store. Um, so having veggies on hand that are organic and frozen is a wonderful way to get through those easy meals. Um, so yeah, I'll, and then fresh olive oil at the end. Usually I'll, I'll cook the veggies. I'll saute them um, with a little bit of ghee. I love ghee. It's very healing. Um, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine, it's actual medicine, you know, let thy food be thy medicine. So sauteing the veggies and ghee, topping it with fresh olive oil. You don't want to cook olive oil at high temperatures because it becomes rancid and creates free radicals in the body. A little bit of salt, some peppers. I recently read that, um, you know, antioxidants, which help keep us young and healthy um, and fight free radicals in the body. When you add herbs to your meals, you can actually double and sometimes triple the antioxidant content of your meal. So even more than vegetables. So you can start off with frozen veggies and top it with your favorite herb blend. And you're actually doing really well in terms of nutrition. So that's another favorite pasta primavera. I actually made that recently too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just, 
um, learning to be creative in the kitchen and try new things I think an experiment you may not always know what you're doing but sometimes just throwing stuff together you end up with like the best meal ever and I know for me cooking used to seem really overwhelmed um I would yeah. like, the pasta primavera yeah. takes what 10 minutes you start boiling the pasta and then you hit the veggies and boom you're done 10 15 minutes I have another one too I'll throw out real quick if you don't mind um, cause it's an easy snack. It's a go-to for me all the time. Um, I am not vegetarian, although I have had many times in my life where I have been, but for me, my nutritional needs are just such that I need to consume meat right now specifically, um, cause I'm in a healing phase, but, um, another favorite, you know, generally I, I do try to stay away from processed foods. It's funny that I mentioned pasta. Now I'm going to mention my other, other go-to <laughs> is, uh, rice cakes. You know, the only thing in them is rice, those organic Lundbergs. They do the rice cakes, or I actually don't even like to have that much of it. So I do the little thin, they have thin stackers, that's what they're called. So they're almost like little crackers. Um, they're the size of maybe a half a piece of bread. And I usually pull two or three of those out. And I top them with avocado, which is delicious. Um, Herbamere, which is a seasoned sea salt. Um, so it's salt with some veggies mixed in. You could also do one with sea vegetables and really increase your mineral intake. Um, and I just put a little bit of that on the avocado. And then I chop up fresh um, red onions, specifically red onion, because it's just a really nice offset, a little bit of arugula, and then a piece of turkey or chicken. Um, I try not to do too many processed meats. So usually I'll have chicken on hand. I just will cook a whole roasted chicken. I'll pull off all of the meat and I keep it in the freezer for easy access. So, you know, it's not processed with a bunch of stuff. It's just frozen chicken. You know, you thaw it out and put it in little, little Ziploc bags, put it in the freezer and you've got easy form of protein go to. If you're vegan, you can top it with hemp or whatever. Um, lots of alternatives, whatever your favorite is. Olives also really healthy source of omega threes. You can just put olives on there. So it's like a really adaptable, easy snack, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I still love rice cakes. Yeah. Um, and I love that you also mentioned freezing things and kind of having them on hand readily. I feel like some people are, don't really know where to start because they don't really have that much in their kitchen because they're used to eating out all the time. Um, but I like some of the suggestions you've already mentioned to make things easier. You know, every time you're at the store, you could just pick up, you know, some for like a few different frozen veggies. Um, I also like to just randomly collect things like chickpeas and beans and rice to, you know, every time I go to the store, just get like a couple things. And so eventually, like you really start to build up a really big stock in your kitchen and the spices and things of that nature. And then you can always, especially if you are, don't like cook for a family and you're just cooking for yourself. I like how you mentioned, like, you know, you can always freeze things um, yeah. and then have leftovers throughout the week. Or even like a month later, you'd be like, I don't feel like cooking. Oh yeah. I have that frozen, like whatever in the fridge. Um, and so thank you for sharing all of that. Really like, yeah. Yes. I'm really glad you mentioned chickpeas because that's a really good vegetarian alternative with the pasta primavera. If you wanted to add some protein, chickpeas or any, any kind of bean really, but chickpeas are wonderful in pasta. When I was vegan, I learned about chickpeas and I ate them like way too much, probably <laughs> like chickpeas. I don't know what protein to use. Oh, I'll just throw some chickpeas in there. Yeah. It any kind great. of bean or lentil is, you know, awesome. And one thing I've been making a lot of recently is bean dips. So basically hummus, but with any bean dip, you can use the tahini or not, but I'm finding it's a great way to get raw garlic in and raw garlic is so good for us. It's anti everything. I don't know, antimicrobial bacterial, blah, blah, blah. If you look it up, it's it's crazy good for us. Antiviral. It's great in times like we've been in lately, but, um, yeah. And it's easy, right? You just, I, I make my beans in the crock pot. I personally don't like canned beans and crock pot beans are very easy. They're very, very easy to make and can also be frozen. I'm a big fan of batch cooking and freezing things that I can then work with, um, in future meals very easily. So I'll just take beans, Olive oil, also a really healthy source of omega threes. So beans, olive oil, lemon juice, garlic, salt in the food processor or a blender. And you've got this delicious bean paste, which you can then put on your rice crackers if you don't have fresh avocado. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, me. And so I want to switch gears just a little bit. Um, and so most of people, especially here in the United States, um, eat the like, you know, traditional American diet with huge portions, very high in fat and sugar and lots of processed things and, you know, fast food. Um, a lot of times some people only eat fast food because they're always on the go or they don't know how to cook for themselves. And so what are some consequences of like having um, the traditional um, American diet? Oof, the, the consequences, you know, when you're younger, there really aren't any, you can get away with a lot. It happens um, when you get older, or like I said, when you run into that stressful situation that weakens your overall immunity, and then you end up with a problem. Um, but really the standard American diet is empty calories, you know, so you're consuming God, there's so much going on here. You're consuming a lot of calories with very little nutrition. So your body is actually starving. You're feeding it and you're feeding it and you're feeding, but it's actually starving. You're malnourished. Um, you don't have the vital nutrients that it takes for your biological process to be, to be optimal. In addition to that, you know, the standard American diet is loaded with two, in my opinion, very poisonous things, unfortunately, and that is um, wheat, any gluten products, um, which comes in many forms. It doesn't just have to say wheat on the back. It can say maltodextrin. What the hell is that? You don't know. You shouldn't be eating it, but usually it's made from a wheat product. It can be made from other products too. So it might be gluten-free and still have maltodextrin. But like I said, if it doesn't make sense up here in your mind, it's not going to make sense to the belly. Um, so Gluten creates a lot of problems in the body, um, a lot of inflammation. And then also the other, in my opinion, poison is GMO corn, right? So it might just say corn on the back. Um, if it's not organic, it might say high fructose corn syrup, which is in like everything. Um, and yeah, those things, they're just very inflammatory. I was amazed when I stopped eating um, just just gluten. I ended up dropping so much weight. I eat like a freaking horse now. I actually do. I eat all day long. I love food. It's crazy. And I stay steady at 135. Before I would starve myself. I was starving myself, Kristen, but I would eat sandwiches. So I would have bread, you know, or I would occasionally eat a taco from Taco Bell. It would be like my one thing I was allowed to have that day, but I'm eating this GMO corn and I was 155 you know, steady, like no, I dropped, so yeah, you stop eating these inflammatory foods and you switch to real food and you can eat a ton and maintain your natural weight, you know? So that's the, the biggest thing is just all the excess weight, you know, and I can see it. I see it on the faces of people. I didn't realize I was inflamed. Nobody thought I was inflamed. Nobody looked at me and said, Stephanie, you've got a lot of inflammation. You should really work on that. I looked healthy. I looked pretty attractive. I carried my weight really well. I was curvy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but now that I've lost all this weight, I can see it in my face. I can tell the difference in my face. I was inflamed. Nobody knew it, but I absolutely was, you know? So there's a huge difference. The first thing would just be weight. The second would just be that we're malnourished and those um, vitamin deficiencies, they come out, like I said, later in life in terms of disease, just things that we run into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it seems like we're in kid, we can eat whatever we want and there's no consequences. And we don't really know any better. Our parents didn't necessarily know. We don't know. Better. And I developed lots of health issues as well, like even as an early teenager from just constantly eating, um, like I would have Pop-Tarts and orange juice for breakfast. That's like a hundred grams of sugar starting my day with. Yeah. And then for lunch, I'd eat like pizza rolls or bagel bites or like a chicken sandwich in the school cafeteria with who knows what was in that. And then, you know, my dinner would be somewhat healthy. My mom would cook for dinner, but, you know, just like constantly just um, feeding my body tons and tons of sugar. And I remember it took me a really long time to realize that I had a serious like sugar addiction because people don't really talk about it that much, but sugar is yeah. highly addictive. Very. It was like, I was living with somebody at the time and I went to the store and I had bought ice cream and they had also bought ice cream, but they had just got this little like thing of gelato at like Whole Foods for us to share. And I had bought two pints of ice cream and like, I wasn't planning on sharing. And that's when I was kind <laughs> of like, and it was like funny, but then I was like, maybe I actually do have like a problem. 
And so I, I remember cutting down on sugar and for like two weeks feeling like I was like dying, yeah. uh, having horrible headaches and all these things I never expected. But now like the only sugar I really eat is um, fruit. And like, occasionally I might have a little bit of like ice cream. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Just- I mean, everything in moderation, everything in balance, even with the dairy thing, like I said, um, it is highly inflammatory, but damn, if it's not good, right. It's so yummy. So lately I've been having a little bit of cheese here and there, mostly when I'm out, I don't bring trigger foods into my house. I won't bring the things in that I know I'm going to overindulge in. And honestly, ever since cleaning up my diet, getting off sugar is huge. I've actually read that it's more addictive than like crack cocaine, heroin. I I mean, I don't know the truth of that, but it's certainly (laughs) addictive and it's definitely hard to get off of. But once you can break that cycle, um, it's huge. You know, just a quick side note. I think that's why Atkins was so popular was Mm -hmm. it limited carbs, but people not just, they didn't, they weren't necessarily just losing weight or water weight. They were losing inflammation, right? Because they had cut out gluten, right? Wheat was a huge one had to go and sugar. There's no way you can make the carb count 20 carbs a day if you didn't cut those things out. So it helps people to break that addiction, at least temporarily. Um, But yeah, it's funny. Once you start eating clean, your tastes change. You don't even want that stuff. You know, recently I had a a rice crispy treat it used to be an old uh, an old favorite of mine and all I could taste was chemicals it straight up tasted like chemicals um yeah so I don't know clean eating it has its own natural progression it's so beautiful it is and your taste buds really do change like I hardly crave sweets maybe if I'm you know in the PMS phase I might want some but I've like transitioned to eating darker chocolate which feels more nourishing anyway um and just yeah, listening to my body for what it needs to eat and not always following like the fads of like keto or, you know, whatever, or, you know, so many people are vegan right now. Not that that's necessarily a fad, but um, just learning what's right for our bodies. And it can be really difficult in the beginning when we cut out things. And so it sounds like, you know, if people are listening and they possibly want to clean up their diet and they're not sure what to cut out first, Um, what would you recommend? Um, I know you've mentioned gluten and dairy. Yeah. Um, and sugar, that's another one. So I would say pick one of those, you know, you can go online and find, um, the most common food sensitivities, which tend to be wheat, corn, dairy, eggs, and soy. Um, you might want to start with an eliminated an elimination diet and cutting those things out and then bringing them back one at a time. That's something I can help people with, um, with my health coaching. That's actually, that was my motivation for doing the health coaching certification was to be able to help people specifically with elimination diets, because they were just such a game changer for me personally, um, to come into right relation with food in general. But yeah, I would say whatever you're most addicted to the thing you're eating the most most and for a lot of people that's gluten because we have what cereal in the morning that's made with wheat we have a sandwich for lunch which is made with wheat and then we have pasta for dinner which is made with wheat so the things that you're eating the most are probably causing reactions in the body if you find that you're having health issues that's usually where it is it's pretty obvious yeah because I'll notice for me like and I kind of joke that I'm like a sugar like kind of like an alcoholic almost but like my addiction to sugar is still present. And I notice if I like have like a cook, like a normal cookie, it'll take like, I'll just be like, oh my goodness. But then a couple of days later, I'll be like, I want another cookie. And then I start wanting like brownies and ice cream. And it's like, you know, so moderation, but now like, instead of getting a cookie at the store, like I'll just make my own. So I know exactly how much sugar is yes. in it. And, Maybe have you made those almond cookies? Just curious. I have not, but oh, I, you got to make them. I know. I have like I bought a whole bunch of almond flour, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna make those because sometimes you just do want a little something sweet and carby, and you know. Uh, but yeah, I really think all the information you're sharing so far is great, and in my personal opinion, and kind of intuitive eating is where it's at too. Like you know, eat something, see how it makes you feel. But you mentioned some of your side effects would be interesting because it would be like a couple of days later and it was hard for you to make a correlation. So what are some um, signs of, you know, food sensitivities? Because 
you know, food allergies, you know, not everybody's going to break into hives when they eat gluten. That's true. Um, no, that is one thing, but there's so many different reactions that you can have. Um, headaches, migraines, acne, eczema, um, you know, any kind of skin rash, really low energy. You know, I recently did an elimination diet. This is kind of depressing because I really love peanut butter. Um, but it was part of why I switched to sun, sun butter. And I really probably will dial back even from that because I, I tend to lean on it, you know, and you want to do everything in moderation, keep really good balance with the diet. But um, I'd cut out peanut butter for a while. And when I decided to bring it back, I ate it twice, you know, a few days apart. And both times that I ate it, I ended up passing out within 20 minutes. I was knocked out just asleep. Um, so, you know, finding that relationship with food is really interesting because a lot of times if we eat something all the time, we just kind of deal with the general fatigue. We have a cup of coffee. We don't realize it's linked to the thing we just ate. You know, I would for breakfast eat um, toast and then I would, or a croissant was my favorite coffee and a croissant. Um, so I would eat that. And then I would drink a cup of coffee to counteract the croissant. So when I stopped eating gluten, I stopped having these tired spells. I actually was able to back way off of coffee. Um, so yeah, migraines, skin rashes, um, joint pain, you know, nightshade vegetables tend to cause joint pain for people, you know, really any symptom, even, um, even like, addiction. I, I had thrown out a question on Facebook, you know, have any of you guys done elimination diets? And this woman commented, she goes, I realized that sugar made me into an addict. I wanted way more of everything. And I was like, Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Cause I can relate, you know, she kind of gave words to an experience of mine itching, you know, I I've noticed that corn makes me itch. Um, so any kind of little niggling thing that you've just sort of adapted to and you think it's normal, it might actually be related to a food sensitivity. Yeah. Very interesting. Cause I know for me, I used to have all these weird symptoms and I could never figure out what it was. And part of it's related to like my cycle. Um, like I started tracking that and like, oh, that's not so random. It occurs during ovulation or it occurs during this time. But there was like all this random, this joint pain that I would get that would seem random. And it's I like, I found uh, it's if I eat too much rice mm. or if I have foods that are too high in sodium, like I eat out and then like instantly, like I will feel really stiff. It's just like, oh, you know, so it's just kind of, yeah, sometimes it can take a while to really figure out. Um, is it, did you mention, um, I think when I was at the cooking class, there was like a website you could go to to test for food sensitivities? Yeah, actually, um, I've done a couple of different tests. My favorite one was the Everly Well test, Everly Well. Um, you can go in order it's uh you do have to prick yourself um to get blood flowing so that you can send in a blood sample i had my partner do it so if you are you know need help with those kinds of things it can be helpful to have somebody do it for you um but yeah it's very pretty really pretty easy you just put a little bit of blood on this card you send it in and they send you your results and there is some controversy over whether these tests are accurate or not but in my opinion if it's showing high reactivity it's accurate and it's something to look at um, but usually it's a two-step process so the food sensitivity test is step one really giving you some awareness around maybe i should look at eliminating these specific foods for a while um, and then step two i would say is really doing that elimination diet and you know this is about progress, not perfection. So you don't, you know, you get your test results and say you're having high reactivity to a number of things like I did. It was kind of shocking because I thought I was a pretty healthy person. Um, but, you know, you don't have to eliminate all five things at once. You can just eliminate the wheat or el eliminate the wheat um, for maybe be six weeks and then bring it back and see how it affects you, you know? Um, so getting that awareness. So yeah, and I also do want to comment on one other thing really quickly. I had made a note here and I don't want to forget. And that was one of the things we talked about a lot at IIN, um, the Health Coaching Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And that's the concept of bio-individuality. Um, and not just the idea that what works for you may not work for me. Like, sure, you can be vegan. Maybe my body doesn't agree with that. Um, you know, and usually when we're young, like I said, we can get away with everything. So everybody can be vegan. And a lot of times, 
people that are are young and I was really young um, and impassioned and came from more of a an emotional mental place than a physical place but as we get older our needs change so it's not just about this diet might work for me but not for you but also it might work for me at a certain time in my life but it may not work for me later you know when you're healing you tend to need more protein and different um different nutrients that are more bioavailable in meat. Um, and at other times you need to back off of meat, you know, cause it's too much and you need to go into more of a cleansing. And so vegetables are really good for detoxing and cleansing the body. So I just wanted to make sure we got that in a, about bio individuality. So people dogmatic eating, um, isn't really helpful for anyone, honestly, yeah. so, a little bit of side, side <laughs> note there. But because it just like there's so many different factors uh, with people, you yeah. know, into what's going to be beneficial for their body. Um, there's times when all I really want to eat is vegetables and I'm just craving vegetables. And then other times, like, I don't want anything to do with vegetables. My body's like, we need a little more meat um, or whatnot. And it's just learning to, to listen to those cues. I think that can be really important. And it can be overwhelming. Like you said, you know, you had all these different sensitivities, but starting with just one thing, uh, I did something really drastic in my, like, uh, know, like six years ago or so. I'm, like, I'm just cutting out everything. That's like, I went on this like candida cleanse diet thing. And the book I read even suggested like doing it over the course of like four weeks, like give up gluten the first week, then dairy, then like whatever. But I was like, I'm gonna do it all at once and it like put such a like toxic load on my body I bet it was like I was cleansing too fast too much and it was just like I felt like I was had the flu for like two weeks yeah. so I definitely recommend going easy just focusing on one thing at a time is definitely really really good advice yeah as well just bringing up all the things that we've already discussed um and then, of course, I'll have links to, you have a blog, is that right? I do, yeah. Um, it's been really fun. I love writing, and so it's been fun writing about health specifically. Um, so I have a, it's a health coaching website, and there's a blog um, attached to that, and it's called mynurturedhealth.com, health. Um, yeah, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of me or to read up a little bit of some of the ideas that we've talked about today. I definitely have blogged about, and that's a good place to get in touch. And then you can see my Facebook and Instagram and all the other links from there. Perfect. Yep. So I'll make sure I put a link to that where um, here on YouTube and also on the website so you can find out more information and also see pictures of some of your yummy food. Yeah. Like, uh, I have to say you've been a really big inspiration for me this past year um, and just like, yeah, like I can do this whole cooking at home thing and it really doesn't take as long as you think it would. Yeah. I mean, you know, as long as you have a good food processor or blender or whatever, you can make up all kinds of things. And so is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? I just want to say that healthy eating is like a really potent form of self-care. You know, I don't think people really like necessarily link the two things. Um, so, it, you know, it's a way of honoring our, our lives, you know, and really taking care of this vessel that we were born into so that we can do all of our other work in the world. It's really, really important. Yes, it is important. So important to take care of our bodies. And I will say this again, and I think I've said it in almost every podcast, but it seems like in some spiritual communities, the focus is so much on like, you know, increasing our vibration and connecting yeah. with ourselves as multidimensional beings. And uh, yes, uh, we're <laughs> like human beings with this body. And if we don't take care of it, we're not going to be here right. to, be able to do the work that we came here to do. That's right. So I like to kind of remind people of that as well. And thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure. I'm really hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> thank but you Kristen <laughs> thank you and thank you to everybody for listening and all of her uh, her links to her website and blog will be posted so you can follow up with her if you have questions or possibly interested in some coaching uh, so awesome thank time. you appreciate it take care